There's one extremely tempting way to introduce our next speaker that I am going to resist. I'm going to resist it because, uh, because I am I'm, I'm a coward. Uh, but you can all think it in your heads. Uh, please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Khan. Thank you very much. And thank you for showing up on a Sunday after lunch when everybody's probably wanting a bit of a nap. Appreciate it. Uh, so hi, yeah, I'm Khan. And this is a talk about the directing first time user experience. Which, if my clicker works, it does not. Okay. So, try and imagine an outlandish scenario, I'm sure for most of you. You are the only writer or narrative designer on your project. Or maybe you're just one of a very small team. And you're working for a small studio. One which always needs to be very careful about how and where it spends its rather limited budget. Your project is ready to record the main character's voiceover. The session is booked for the day after tomorrow. You've got a professional voice actor booked for several hours in a professional sound booth with a professional sound engineer and everything. And a professional voice director who's going to handle it. And the day before the session, the voice director gets laryngitis. And all eyes turn to you. Sincerely, though, my clicker isn't working. <laughs> um, I don't know. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, you are the story person. You know, you know the script. You have the most familiarity with the situation. And they know they haven't, that you haven't done it before. But they're like, you can handle this, right? And so it may not surprise you to learn that that poor dev with the deer in the headlights expression wasn't me. Um, I was really lucky. Before I had to solo direct a session, I had a lot of warning. I had a lot of prep time. And most importantly, I had already shadowed my extremely experienced and capable mentor for several sessions, and I even had him right there in the room with me, ready to uh, help in case I needed on something on the spot. I was working for a studio that could afford retakes and pickup sessions. I had AAA privilege. <laughs> and because I recognize how lucky I was, I kind of want to pay that forward now. So to do that, today I'm going to be going over uh, well, what to expect on the day, how to succeed, even if it's your first time, and what to, what to do if something goes wrong. Um, I won't be going over casting, budgeting, technical advice, each of those as a separate talk, and I'm only qualified to give like one of them, uh, and this talk, I suppose. Uh, over the last 17 years, I've worked at a bunch of different studios in four countries and on a bunch of different games on different platforms from AAA to free to play as a game writer, designer, narrative designer, and or people manager in one form or another. Um, a fair amount of the last six or seven of those years has been spent writing scripts for recording, preparing casting sides and character sheets evaluating auditions and self-tapes to select who we wanted for callbacks, directing voiceover auditions, and, of course, directing voiceover recording sessions, uh, both in person and since COVID remotely. I've worked with amateurs and nobodies and some very big names talent-wise. So let's get right into it by walking you through what a day in the booth might look like. And let's pretend that you know nothing at all about uh, directing whatsoever and that you're shadowing me during a typical AAA recording session lasting four hours. I can't speak to anyone else's style, so I'll just take you along with me and explain as we go. Uh, before we get into it, though, let us quickly cover some of the basic jargon. Uh, a take is a single recorded um, file with a single file name. It's like a shot in film. Uh, an alt, or you know, getting an alt take means that you need to, ch to change the script, you are getting different wording, your cans are your headphones, but to say something is in the can means it's successfully recorded. And a note is the direction given to the actor after a take to try and change the performance and get something closer to what they need. We're going to be talking about notes a lot. Um, breaths, or breathings, or oh no's, or exerts, there's all sorts of names for them um, from studio to studio. These basically mean reactions 
that are automatically triggered by the game as opposed to triggered specifically by the level designer, or narrative designer, whoever it is, um, they are systemic. Um, screams and shouts means anything that is delivered at a high volume. Talkback, or a talkback mic, is the intercom system between the booth and the room. Um, and a hot mic is a microphone that is on and transmitting, which can sometimes be an issue with a talkback mic. And last but not least, pop shield is a physical protection filter for a mic to prevent pops. Before I even run you through a day in the booth, though, let's talk about onboarding. I reserve at least 15 minutes at the beginning of the session for the first time that I'm meeting an actor, and then five or 10 minutes at the beginning of every later session with them. So I need to introduce myself. I need to make a bit of small talk, find out about them, uh, if they're, including if they're a gamer, for example, or familiar with the kind of game that we're making. I'll be friendly and enthusiastic about working with them. There we go, sorry. And I'll make sure that they have water, green tea, anything else that they want. Oh, pants. Um, do not skip that step. It is not optional. It is really important to be able to build a rapport with an actor. It sometimes feels like it's cutting into your time, but step one is allowing them to believe that you are a person who wants the best out of them and who is willing to work with them. I'm going to start with onboarding materials. I'm going to cover the tone of the game, the setting, and the genre. Now, the tone is a really important one to, to cover in onboarding. Um, the most recent game I was working on before the one I'm on now, it was Dead Island 2. And so, for example, we would start off with, this is not a subtle game. This is blood splatter in the sunshine. Start at an 11 and kind of go up from there. Um, there's almost no way you can give a performance that is too over the top. Everything is larger than life. These are pulp characters. And that was a really important thing to establish about the whole uh, project. Um, similarly, if there's expectations that the player might have about the genre, you know, FPS players are going to expect this, but narrative players, you know, uh, players of a narrative indie game are going to expect something else. And letting them know that, especially if they're not familiar with the genre, is really important. You talk to them about their character. You've given them their character sheet beforehand. Um, you ask them if they have any questions, and you confirm what you think their character needs to do, what your vision is for the work their character needs to do to advance your story or to get the player into the right mood in the game. In other words, um, really make sure that they understand what you're trying to go, again, overall with their character. The most important bit now is showing them your references, which you will have sent beforehand. Um, key art and concept art is very annoying to writers, but pictures are often worth a thousand words and being able to show some images of not just their character, but of the game itself can save you a lot of explanation time. If you can at all, remember these guys are NDA'd, you can trust them, and it's part of establishing the trust with an actor that you show them everything you can that will help them understand what game they're making, that they're helping you make. So make a gameplay video, you know, it, it does not have to be polished, but even just 30 seconds will save you so much time. And if you can't, if you don't have enough for a gameplay video yet, for example, a soundscape, and again, even if you don't have an accurate one, a representative one of like, when you're in combat, this is the kind of music that's gonna be playing. This is the competing sounds from the monsters. This is what your voice is going to have to be competing with or speaking over or working with in this situation and that situation. Again, take a few minutes for that. It is incredibly useful. And last but not least, this is optional, but if you have a like little get into character monologue um, or a little scene that you can play with them, uh, a little bit of a longer or more complex scene, maybe their audition script again, it is really helpful to get them into character by doing that first. Um, getting a couple of takes of that is also like, hey, extra material for the website, awesome. Uh, later on, or to share on social media. So, now you're about to go to a nice, fancy recording studio. Get there a half an hour early, like at least. When we say a session starts at 10, that means the actor is in the booth and getting set up at 10, or that the onboarding session starts at 10. It does not mean you get there at 10. You need to be uh, checking in with the receptionist. 
you know, getting yourself your water, making sure your tech setup works. If you have your script on your laptop, you gotta connect to the Wi-Fi, you gotta get plugged in. Do not waste the actor's time by doing all of that when they're in the booth. And then you are gonna meet your new best friend, who is the sound engineer. Um, and with them, you're going to set up before the actor's arrival. So you're gonna confirm that the reference material that I talked about that you sent them already, you sent them several days ago, has been received, is good to go, that they can play it, that it's showing on their screen, that they didn't need to download anything. Um, you're gonna make sure that any file naming conventions have, that have already been sorted out are, are understood and correct. And then let's talk about the rhythm of the session a little bit. So after onboarding, we'll start going down the script I've prepared and getting our takes in the can. I'll ask for one or two takes and listen to those before giving any notes. I want to let them surprise me. Um, once we hit our stride, oh, no, sorry, zoot. Here we go. Once, uh, once we hit our stride, then I can often give them notes after just one take, but uh, at least a couple. So um, if it's a scene or a conversation, I will feed them their lines. Um, I'm not expected to act, but if I can, I'll give them some representative emotion as long as my own performance is not distracting me from focusing and listening and evaluating to their performance. Like one of us is getting paid to act here and it is not me. I will keep notes as I go on my script as to which takes I like or which one, what I didn't like about a take as we go so that I can give the actor a more useful note before the next line. And if it's a longer line and we are on the struggle bus, um, I, will at, I could ask the engineer to stitch two different takes of a, uh, of two different takes together. So it's like, hey, can we get the first sentence from take two and the second one from take six? Um, this is, a, you know, it's a possibility, but, but do not... Six or seven takes. Honestly, just put a pin in it make a note on your script, ask the engineer to make a note, and then revisit that line later on in the session. There is no need to belabor that. It'll just make everybody involved anxious and you're not gonna get that good a take anyway. Um, sorry, nope. PowerPoint is the devil. It is the yeah. devil. This is why we all moved to Google. Microsoft, I'm looking at you. Uh, Okay, so it, is, um, so it is my job to start and end the session on time. Ending on time is really important, by the way. You're paying the actor for a specific amount of time, and again, don't take the piss with that. Um, and it is my job to schedule and enforce and call breaks on a regular basis. Um, so I tend to do at least a 10-minute break every 60 to 80 minutes, depending on how long the total session is and how it's going. Um, so yeah, and it's my job to indeed end on time. Um, yeah, after the session, uh, thank them very much for their efforts, even if it was an entirely shit session. Thank them very much and tell them that they did really well um, and that you appreciate their hard work. Do not make a lot of small talk and unless they look like they're kind of jittery and full, full of adrenaline and want to keep talking to you. Most of them will be kind of tired. They will want to go home. They have another appointment. They have something else to do. Respect that. Say thank you very much and let them get out of there. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't know. Okay, um, this is a fairly large and fancy production control room and recording booth um, from a trip to Los Angeles five or six years ago. So let's take a look around. These are some of the things that you might see. Uh, first one is your new bestie, the sound engineer. Um, as you can see, they've got, their own, they've got their own setup. They've got their own magic box over here that does magic things um, and that you should respect uh, their, their expertise when it comes to the quality of takes. There's you, or me in this case, the director, and this is the script that the sound engineer and the actors can see, and it has the information that they need. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is my script. I will be hiding different columns. I will have extra columns for like notes on different takes or what I like about things, um, but the actors do not need to see that script. Nobody needs to see feedback in real time. That's, ugh, no, that's just going to put them off entirely. 
That is the talkback mic um, that I mentioned before. So there's usually a little button on it that is a push to talk, and the actors cannot hear you when you are not pushing the little button because they are in a soundproof booth. Sounds obvious, but you'd be amazed at how many people just start talking because they can see the actors. Um, there they are. They're wearing their cans. Uh, some, some booths have a, a PA system or something like that, uh, speakers, so that the actors don't need to wear headphones. But honestly, they, um, most actors prefer to if they're in this kind of situation because they get a much clearer um, sound quality. And mic and stand. Mic technique is a, is a thing, you know? You have to make sure that the actors are standing about where they need to be. It is the sound engineer's job to monitor this, but you know, keep an eye on it as well. The pop shield I mentioned before, and the monitor, usually inside and out, that shows what the actors can see, in this case, um, reference art. Uh, and last but not least, there's another actor, if you were wondering who that is, um, just waiting for his next scene and looking at things. And I cannot emphasize enough how important hydration is, not just for the actors, but for you as well. People think that voiceover directing sessions mean that you're listening to an actor for a long time. No, you are talking very nearly as much as the actor is. You need to safeguard their voice, you need to safeguard your voice as well. You need to hydrate, on that note. So, we do, however, live in a post-2020 world, and it is in entirely possible that you could be ending up remotely directing a session. So most things are actually going to say this, stay the same. You'll still need to be there early. You'll still need to confirm the session's rhythm with your sound engineer. Hey, we're planning to take breaks at about these intervals. Do you have the file names? Are you sure what's going on? I'm not. Uh, you'll need to end on time. Um, what is different? Know what app you'll be using during the session. For the most part, um, recording studios will have sent me a Zoom link, but test your tech beforehand. Call a friend using that app, especially if you're not familiar with it, and make damn sure that your internet connection is stable. That is not optional. Get off Wi-Fi if you can. Plug in. Pretend it's the old days. Uh, don't work from a coffee shop. Don't be that guy. <laughs> I wouldn't believe people, like, I've seen this try to happen. It's just, it's, ne it's never going to work. Make sure you are somewhere quiet. Make sure you are somewhere free of distraction for you and of background noise for the actors. Noise-canceling headphones are great, but your mic still works, dude. <laughs> they can hear all of the noise around you. So um, the actor may not be able to see you due to a monitor setup. Maybe they're recording from a home studio, for example. Um, but if, if they can make, um, if they can see you, Make eye contact with your camera when giving them notes. I find googly eyes on the camera is a really helpful thing to try to pretend it's a face. Do not look at their image on your screen. And when you are listening to takes, I suggest turning your camera off because, again, nobody needs to see the live feedback from making that face out loud either. So now that you know kind of what to expect from the day, let's talk about succeeding as a director. Um, I think there's just a few things that you need to ensure, in general, a fairly good outcome. Uh, especially as a first-time director, your success is going to live or die on how well prepared you are. And we'll talk about that quite a lot. Um, how well you work with the talent ensures making sure that their head is in the right space. And as well as yours. You need to let go of your ego and certainty a little bit as well, which is weird. I'm, I'm going to give you some advice that says that you need to have a very clear vision, but then you also need to be able to let go of that vision and let the actors help you create these characters. Um, preparation involves fully preparing your materials and documentation, doing some uh, pretty heavy detailed planning of how the session is going to go, and doing some heavy thinking about what you want out of this session, what your vision is. So, materials, a technical brief should be sent to the studio ahead of time by whomever in your team understands things like sample rates or bit rates and specific microphone tack types and can answer specific questions. That is very much not me, so I'm not going to be going into it. What I do need to know is how my audio person or people need files to be named so that they work with our engine. So I can double check that during the onboarding with, and the setup with the sound engineer. 
Like, if I need an alt, and that might be several takes, we didn't plan that file, so does that get a, like, underscore 01 at the end, 0203? Does it get an underscore A? What is useful here? Like, oh God, no underscores? You know, literally figure out what you're, because renaming that kind of batch files, they're not named usefully yet. You have no idea what they are. They're just sort of automatically generated file names. So uh, your character sheet should include key art or at least visual references and a nice, short, clear biography. Look, again, the art of casting sides and character sheets is a whole nother talk, but um, it should be sent to the talent as soon as possible, basically. Uh, oh, oops. And um, the kinds of key art, the kinds of gameplay videos, audio soundscapes, all of that that I mentioned, very, very useful, but they're not useful if you send them the morning of. So make sure that you send them ahead of time. Uh, right, regarding scripts, final draft works for cutscenes, but does not usually work well with a lot of short lines or barks, uh, especially for like the sound engineer's needs. So industry standard is still a spreadsheet and usually Excel. Like we can cuss against Microsoft all we like, but there's a reason it works. Um, a lot of sound studios, uh, recording studios will have automatic software, for example, to highlight the next line down, to auto-fill in file names, so the format for your scripts is actually kind of important. Um, chunk your script up into sections and categories. Break up heavy emotional scenes with more neutral scenes or lines um, so that you can allow the actor to sort of recombobulate between them. Group types of lines together and put the screams at the end. And also the whispers, by the way, those aren't like free, those aren't easy either on the voice. Um, clearly delineate conversations if you can without leaving a bunch of empty rows. Again, it might screw with the software that they have. Uh, and confirm with the recording studio ahead of time what kind of data they need, what kind of columns they need. And um, uh, you're probably going to be turning a developer-facing document into a talent-facing document. So what I mean by like only the info that they need is, uh, you know, there's notes to level design. Trigger this line at X point. The actor doesn't need to see that. The sound engineer doesn't need to see that. It shouldn't be in your script. Notes to translators explaining an idiom. Hopefully the actor understands the idiom. Unless it's a really weird one, you don't need that in the notes to your script. Um, what they do need, are pronunciation guides, especially if you are working on a fantasy or sci-fi game and you have a lot of words with a lot of apostrophes. <laughs> Throw them a bone, give them a hand, and let them prepare. Especially if they have done, if the actor has done their job and read the script ahead of time and gotten an idea of what they're going to be doing, um, they will practice a word the way they think it should be pronounced. And if you tell them on the day it's pronounced differently it's really hard sometimes to recalibrate. So again, help them do their job. Um, and the other thing that the actors would find useful in the script are like relationship guides. What does the actor, well, sorry, what does the character feel about this other character they're having this scene with? What is their history with the space they're in? In other words, give them as much context as you can. And context is in fact so important that we are gonna dive into it a little harder. Um, Overall context should be defined for the scene or conversation and not repeated line by line. Again, you don't need that extra brain space to parse a note that says the same thing essentially as the note above it. Um, also, if it's a conversation, make sure you keep the whole conversation in the script, the context lines, even if it's not lines that actor will be saying, they need to know what they're reacting to. It sounds obvious, but you would be surprised how often that happens. Um, if I'm an actor, here's what I would want to know, and don't take it from me, I'm going to quote from uh, Amelia Tyler, who, if you don't know, is a sincerely fabulous vo voice actor I've worked with, um, who wrote a guide to working with voice actors. Uh, you might know her most recent work as the narrator in Baldur's Gate 3. So she says, as an actor, where am I? Like, I've, you know, I know who I am, you've sent me my character sheet, but like, am I in a cave, a pub? A forest, that is all going to change how I project or what I'm expecting the rest of the sound to be doing. Um, show me images of that space if possible. 
and it, you, there's nothing that says you have to front load all of your reference art in the, sec in the session. You can always show, like for this next four conversations, you're in this room, isn't it weird? Let's talk about what it looks like and what it's for. Where is everyone else? Am I talking to somebody far away? Is, am I, are we trying not to be overheard or to be overheard? Um, am I worried about what they think of me? And again, how am I projecting for that? Speaking of, am I worried? How am I feeling? Like, what has just happened? Where is my character coming from in the scene just before this or in the situation before this? Um, are we gearing up for a fight or getting ready for bed? Because that is a really different vibe. Do I like the person I'm talking to? What do I think of them? And what am I doing while I am talking? Am I just standing there? Am I shifting weight nervously? Am I running? Am I fighting? That action will dictate how I speak and how I project. And what else is happening around? Again, this is where that audio soundscape at the beginning, when you can say, you're in combat, and if you remember, that means that the player's gonna be hearing this, that, and the other thing as well, or it's dead quiet, there's maybe a trickly drip of water, and you're, you can kind of whisper, you can really uh, bring that volume right down. So let's talk about planning the session. First of all, have a plan. Read your own script out loud to, is, is the first step to estimating how long it'll take. Um, and it's also a really good way of spotting tongue twisters. Um, even include, maybe as you're reading out loud, notes on a couple of different takes, and maybe some fake notes, and maybe some fake questions to the engineer. In other words, it's not just reading one line at a time. That's not gonna help you estimate things. Prioritize those sections or lines or scenes according to what you know you have to get in the can this session and what you know if worse comes to worse, that content could be cut or it could be recorded by somebody else or whatever it is. Um, when you're planning out timings for an experienced actor and director combination, for a player character, the average sort of velocity for recording wild lines, by which I mean single lines, not part of a scene, uh, is like 40 to 60 hours, uh, pff, hours, <laughs> 40 to 60 lines per hour for a player character, and maybe 30 to 45 lines per hour for a, an NPC, as those lines tend to be longer or more complex. Again, very, very high, like, your mileage may vary. Um, facial capture, again, that's a whole nother talk, but that slows everything way, 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 way down. Uh, if the actor needs to match the rhythm of an existing video, just like how long their line takes, then we're talking like, you'll be lucky to get one line in the can every four, five, eight minutes. And if they need to lip sync, we're talking one line every 10 minutes. Um, optional, and you know your own anxiety levels obviously better than I do, but uh, this is a useful, <laughs> a useful tool for a lot of people. If you're not familiar, a risk log is where you sit down and brainstorm all of the risks, all of the possible things that could go wrong, no matter how outlandish, one after the other. And then you think ahead of time, if this happens, what would I do? I would, okay, go to the store and get them a replacement cable. I would have my colleague ready to send me a script, copy, whatever it is, right? Um, when I, that, that photo from earlier was the trip to LA, my risk log was insane because I was a lot riding on me. It was my first like overseas directing experience and uh, the audio director, who was, if you can recall, a very sli small sliver of head in the very foreground of the photo, looked at this risk log and he was like, oh my god, I had plans for earthquakes, for city evacuations, for the IP holder to completely change their mind, for the actor to have died. <laughs> like, <laughs> I thought, and you know, you'd think that I would sort of work myself up in a froth about this, but actually it was, it was really useful to think that, okay, no matter what happens, I think I, I think I have at least the first idea of what I might do and who I might ask for help. And then the director's job is to have a vision and work with the talent to create takes that help support that vision. So um, be prepared to onboard your actor onto your project. And again, not necessarily what, like you don't need to give an introduction to this game genre, you need to narrow that down to what the actor needs to understand about the genre to give you the performance that you need. 
t have some thoughts about what this recording session needs to do creatively for your game, for your project, what this scene needs to do. And you've already thought logistically, okay, these are the ones that we have to get in the, in the can. Now you think creatively, which ones have to be perfect? or as perfect as we can get them. Which ones are, which scenes, which lines, which moments is it vital that we nail? And which ones are like, it, if it's good enough, if it's fine, if it's good enough to ship, like do prioritize that because otherwise you will work yourself into a froth on the day trying to get every single line and take perfect and nobody can. So working with the talent, your most important job is to make them feel safe because Okay, there's, a, there's a, a, a quote that's usually attributed to Hemingway, which says, writing is easy. You simply sit down at a typewriter, open a vein, and bleed. And acting is on the same spectrum. You know, you have to be vulnerable to be able to convey these emotions believably. You have to feel at least some pale shadow of those emotions. And that is dangerous emotionally. It is difficult, that vulnerability has to be there, however, and so we need to create a space where the actors are able to be vulnerable. So, this you're gonna need to fake. Uh, the actor does need to feel like they are in good hands with you. So, um, you know, please note as we go forward, there is no one size fits all with actors. Each one of them is different. Each one of them should be met where they are, and you, that's one of the purposes, by the way, of finding out about them in the onboarding session. There are a few best practices to making them feel safe. As I mentioned, emotionally difficult content should not be all grouped together so that they feel like they've been put through the ringer. Give them, if, it also if there are sort of, not everybody reacts to emotionally different content the same way. Everybody has kind of their own histories and triggers and anxieties. That's why you send them the script ahead of time and kind of give them a heads up that this is gonna be talking about the death of a parent or the you know maiming of a whatever it is. Um, Make sure that you safeguard their, their animal body. Those breaks are not optional. That hydration is not optional. And the physically taxing content, the whispers and the screams, go at the end. If you have more than like maybe, I mean 30 minutes of, of screams is a lot. If you have more than that, my God, you need two sessions. You know, do two shorter sessions instead of one huge long one. And remember that whispers uh, and other sort of loudly projected lines are not, are not free. Um, help them feel professionally prepared, not just sending the scripts, but if you can involve them by uh, scheduling table reads, uh, having an onboarding session that's just over a Zoom call, not in the expensive studio. Pay them for their time, to be clear, obviously, but um, let them help you create the character by not feeling that they're on the back foot at, during the session. And trust them, collaborate with them. Um, this is, again, a little bit about letting go of your ego, but let them make creative decisions as they go. Don't have too strong a vision for what this character needs to sound like. Have the vision for what this character needs to feel while this line or scene is happening and what you want the audience to feel while this line or scene is happening. If you remember very little else, remember this. Um, give them the space and freedom to experiment a little bit and you will get better results. So, you've now gotten an idea of what to expect and how to over high level collaborate with a voice actor. So, but with that spirit of trust in mind, let's look at giving actors notes on their performances, which is most of what we do when things go wrong. That's mostly what, how we problem solve. Um, and remember, <laughs> An actor wants to please you. It's their job to give you what they want. So uh, give them the tools to give you what you want and they will do their very best to give it. Okay, they've given a line, uh, you've gotten a couple of takes of this line and it's just not the right vibe. The vibes, they are off. <coughs> Fix only one or two things in each note. There's no sense of going, okay, what I need you to do is do it faster and louder and this, ba -ba 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 -ba, and then by the time you've gotten to the end of your notes, the actor will remember a couple only anyway and won't know which ones are the most important. So fix one or two things at a time and prioritize the most important thing to fix first. Um, 
do not try to fix this by giving them a line read. If you don't know what that means, it's when um, you give a performance that you expect them to parrot back, but you are not hiring a parrot, you are hiring an actor. And your performance is probably not as good as you think it is. Uh, also, this is um, quite offensive to most actors. They're, they, yeah, in, just, just don't do it, just don't do it. Um, <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it's just that they don't understand what a word or phrase or the whole line is about or what it means. Maybe there's a word of voc vocabulary or jargon that they're not familiar with or an idiom that's less familiar or an archaic kind of phrase. So, you know, maybe just confirm that they understand what they're saying. Now, here's the one that if you forget nothing else, uh, if you forget nothing else, nice. If you use nothing else, this is the useful one. Um, analogies or uh, representative relative situations, that's, they are your friends. This is how you make, okay, to give you an idea. If, if I have a, a, a pain noise that I'm asking the actor to, to make, no actor has actually been bitten by a reptilian subterranean humanoid <laughs> while being a space marine. Can you tell I worked on a Gears of War title? But if I give them a fairly direct, it's a stubbed tool, or what they find relaxing, you tell two different people, like there's a big spider, say it like there's a big spider on your pillow that you've just spotted, or say this like you are on a ski slope on the top of a mountain at dawn, like some people are gonna find that ladder thing wonderful, and some of us are gonna be very cranky. So it's really useful to find out what they would feel. Um, so yeah. That, that last one, for example, is not my happy place. I would want a beach and a cocktail. So you've provided context, but sometimes subtext is what you need. Because the line medic sounds very different in the performance that they gave, which said, oh God, I'm bleeding and I'm going to die, versus the performance you wanted, which is, I'm a professional soldier, I've applied a tourniquet to the wound, and I would appreciate a stretcher at your earliest convenience. Ask for a sneer. Facial expressions come through. Frowning eyebrows, a big smile. I'm exaggerating a little, but they do come through. So ask them to make the facial expression that, you, that would match um, the emotion of the line you want. As a side note, when you are listening to the takes, I tend to not look at the actors during their takes. Actors are and should be very good at conveying emotion, uh, emotion with their whole face, with their body language as well. And so you can watch this amazing performance and think, great, I got a great take. But the players are never gonna see that amazing performance. They're only going to hear it. And that take might not actually be doing what you think it's doing. When you listen back to it later, it could be quite flat. So I'll ask for a sneer and then I won't look at it. <laughs> it's, um, but it works. Change what their body is doing. A lot of times that can help. Sometimes it's just about shaking it out. Oh, God, get rid of the nerves. Sometimes, oh, I need the voice to be a little higher and tighter, so I want you to do the line with your arms above your head. Sometimes uh, if you're doing breathing exerts, heavy, ask them to carry something heavy, a, a pitcher of water or a, a large book or something like that, and I'd literally be carrying something heavy while they're making the noises like they are in making an effort. Um, and... When in doubt, if, you, if neither you or the actor can quite figure out what's going on, just ask them how they as a person would feel in that kind of relative um, situation. Here are some useful phrases, um, because giving notes that the actor can use is a huge part of the director's skill set. Every time I talk to you, you're busy. Every time I talk to you, you're busy. Now, don't lose that final... Uh, consonant in talk, please, because it sounds like every time I talk to you, you're busy. Let's tighten it up. Every time I talk to you, you're busy. That's like faster. Or separate it out. Every time I talk to you, you're busy. Okay, great. Same delivery, but not faster. Let's just remove those pauses. Every time I talk to you, you're busy. And again, one that's not louder, but maybe projected a little bit more. Um, other useful phrases. Let's make it a little bit more urgent. Let's make it a little bit more relaxed. Softer and harder is like emotionally, you know, oh, every time I talk to you, you're busy. Really relish the irritation here. Every time I talk, let's really downplay that emotion there. Every time I talk to you, I'm, I'm, I'm 
finding my space, I'm finding my, my calm. Emphasizing this word instead of that one is a really useful thing because it's a, it's a note that still lets the actor play around with um, the delivery, but, you know, he never told her he loved only her. He never told her he loved only her. He never told her he loved only her. He never, you get the idea, like English isn't a tonal language. And um, a nice one is one more for luck, which can imply, I think, that we've got the, um, I think we got the take we need, but let's, let's give you a little space to play around with. Uh, yeah, their voice sounds a little weird. Um, wet noises and phlegm sound appalling if you are on high quality headphones at home playing this game. So keep green apples on hand. Annoyingly, they have to be green, but a little bite of a green apple will really help clear up kind of a phlegmy sound. A raspier dry voices, check they're hydrated. Um, and then if they are, maybe offer a little bit of either room temperature or warmer or even hot, depending on what the actor wants, tea. And if you have Manuka honey on hand, you could be their new best friend. Some actors, for whatever reason, have this habit of before they say a sound, uh, before they say a line, just, and again, it it's sounds awful in the headphones. If they're doing it consistently, it's often the sign of an inexperienced actor. Um, you can work with the sound engineer and just have them cut it out of every file, but they do have to make sure that they do so because most files just start, uh, it starts recording when, they, when it hears a noise, basically. So they'll need to be kind of cut out uh, Manually, that's the word. So yeah, as I said, pops and plosives, that's what those sound like, and that's where you should rely on their sound engineer to uh, tell you if that was a good take. And if you're in any doubt, can I just hear that last one back, is your last really useful phrase for the sound engineers. One quick note on working with amateur talent. Um, that might, if, you're, if your talent has never worked in games, you might have some extra challenges. A screen actor who doesn't have their props and their space to move their bodies might freeze up in front of a mic. A stage actor might get kind of hammy and be playing for a back row that isn't there um, and be over the top. Sometimes that's what you want, Dead Island, but sometimes it's not. And neither of them are likely to have much mic, mic technique. Um, however, you might be working with your mate who you're paying in pizza because that's who you got. And they're, they're probably going to be self-conscious and as we know, like self-consciousness and discomfort are death. They're kryptonite to a good performance. So warm up with something ridiculous. Uh, if you are familiar with the penis game, <laughs> you know, if you um, are able to uh, join them in that ridiculousness, you know, giving serious news in a SpongeBob or a Skeletor voice, that might really help. Um, oops. Give them that getting into character monologue that I mentioned at the beginning, like take that time and maybe get the sound engineer to teach them a little bit of mic technique during their onboarding. And do what you have just gotten now, tell them what to expect, tell them what the rhythm of a session feels like um, and walk them through the plan beforehand. Also warn them not to have any dairy beforehand, the morning of or even the day before because it is also death to vocal performances. Uh, as I wrap up, a quick acknowledgement of my AAA privilege. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, my mentor at Splash Damage, Ed Stern, who's a lovely man who's forgotten more about voiceover direction than I may ever learn. He wrote um, three very good articles that might be useful for you as well and pointed me towards Amelia Tyler's um, guide to working with voice actors. For extra credit, if you don't think you'll be as lucky as I was and you still have not had your first directing experience or even if you've had just a few, here's some things that you can also do. Shadow other recording sessions wherever you can. Make notes and observe. Um, if you meet somebody this weekend who will be willing to like let you sit in on their session, that would be worth the time. There's always something to learn. Everybody has very different directing styles. Um, do some acting of your own, if you can, at all. Amateur dramatics, student films are always desperate for actors, and it will teach you how to speak actor, and how it feels to take direction, which is really useful. Uh, 
on that note, hold mock directing sessions with like your colleagues playing the actor and maybe an audio designer playing the sound engineer. See how that feels. Work out your jitters beforehand in a dry run instead of very expensively uh, during the session. So I hope that with what I've given you, when you are next in the director's chair, even if it is for the first time, you won't feel like a deer in the headlights, but you will be able to deal with it no matter what happens. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>